Hi, everyone. My name is Lena Reinhardt. I'm Fuchs on Twitter. And I'm specializing in marketing, community care, and project management in tech. I'm committed to the open source projects Hoodie and Apache CouchDB. And I'm a co-founder and CEO at The Neighbor Hoodie, a software development and consulting company. What you can see behind me is an acre in southern Germany, close to the village where I grew up. And this is where this talk begins. This acre in southern Germany, this land is cultivated land. This is culture. The English term culture evolved in the mid-15th century and originally meant the tilling of land. It was about who cared for which parts of land, who did the work on it, and who brought in the harvest. There's also a figurative sense of culture, which leads us to the main case in which we refer to it today. Our modern term culture is the expression of the way we act and refers to a community or group which shares common experiences that shape the way its members understand the world. I work in the tech world and I contribute to open source. And I love what I do because I found amazing people there and great projects which have become near and dear to me. Still, the future of open source is in danger. This is why in this talk, I want us to take a look at culture in the world of free, libre, and open source software today. And to make it a bit easier for both you and me, I'll just refer to open source from now on. And even if you're not contributing to open source projects yourself, most of these topics are applicable to general tech culture and human interaction in general today. Technology-wise, open source is highly relevant. Mobile, social media, cloud services, and big data for very important technologies of our time rely heavily on open source. Open source is also relevant for business. It contributes 450 billion euros per year only to the European economy. So, things are going great in open source, right? Let me show you one thing first. The amazing people from Geek Feminism Wiki are collecting sexist incidents in geek communities, including technology industry, open source software, gaming, and more. This is the number of sexist incidents per year, starting in the year 2000. Today, on September 14, 2014, the number of sexist incidents only this year is 52. Although this graphics does not only display incidents in open source software, it depicts one thing clearly. A lot of things are going terribly wrong in our communities and their culture. And here's why. Often, when you talk about open source projects, people quickly refer to the community and are usually very excited about it. So let's take a closer look at communities. Diana Harrelson, an anthropologist, did scientific research on the Fedora project. 75% of the respondents to her questions agreed that they felt that the Fedora project is a community. Some adding answers like, the community is the project, and without the community, we're lost. But when we're talking about the community, and even if you're appreciating it, there's one essential point we must not miss. As Joseph Raz, a philosopher, phrased it, if the culture is decaying or if it is discriminated against, the options and opportunities open to its members will shrink. Community is not just about building nice stuff and hanging around with nice people in chat rooms, mailing lists, or on conferences like this one today. Every troll, every sexist comment, every harassment towards just one single community member will directly harm this person, the entire community, the product that you're building, and finally open source in general, its values, its ideas, and its existence. One major deterministic of culture is language. Mars Climate Orbiter, which you can see in this picture, was a robotic space probe launched by NASA in 1998 to study the climate, atmosphere, and surface changes on Mars. This space probe finally got lost in space. It disintegrated due to atmospheric stresses. What was the reason for this robot's death? It was caused by a human communication failure. Four pieces of software producing and expecting data in different units Two navigators from the teams involved had pointed out those issues, but their concerns had been dismissed. 
What happened to Mars Climate Orbiter is briefly described by Conway's law, introduced in 1968 by Melvin Conway, a computer programmer. Conway's law states that organizations which design systems produce designs which are copies of their communication structures. Open source carries Conway's law to extremes. As a scientist phrased it, in open source, there is a hybridism of dialogue and code, where the dialogue is directly embedded in the code. They called open source a network of people and things that is constructed through the materialization of language. In other words, all communications in an open source project will have direct impact on the product, like the software that you're building. All communications, no matter if there are any, if there are none, and if they're peaceful or violent. I want to show you a part of the Endangered Languages project. Every dot you can see on this map excerpt stands for one of over 3,000 languages that are currently at risk of becoming extinct. Language loss is not new, and even if a few of those languages disappeared, large parts of the world population could still talk. So why should we care if languages are lost? Let me ask you two things first. Who of you has ever contributed to a free, libre or open source project? Oh, well, that's plenty. And who of you is a programmer or has ever done anything related to programming, like editing a bit of HTML or CSS? Okay, <laughs> huge overlaps, I see that. As people who can deal with programming languages, you know that one of their core functionalities is that language shapes reality. One change in an expression in the source code of an application can affect everything and break everything. I guess some of you have heard of that. Language is an essential part of our culture and it shapes the way we express ourselves. And this is why when one language disappears into oblivion, we are all diminished. Thus, silencing people and their voices in open source destables and endangers each and every one of us. We in open source have to stop silencing people when they speak out about threats, mobbing, sexism, and other topics that show our broken culture. Open source is the materialization of language, and our community culture influences every one of us. This is why we have to take even more care of the culture in open source communities, because the future of open source will be mainly determined by its culture. Let's see which other aspects we have to care for in our communities and start this with a short excursion to biology. As Charles Elton, an ecologist, argued, simple, non-diverse communities are more easily upset than richer ones. That is, they're more vulnerable. In biology, there's a special research field for this topic, and part of it is the so-called stability-diversity hypothesis. In short, this hypothesis states that the more diverse a community is, the more stable and productive it is. A great example for space which is diverse by default are rainforests. Typically, they possess a great deal of species diversity. Around 40 to 75 percent of all biotic species are native to the rainforests. Same goes with coral reefs. They occupy less than 0.1 percent of the world's ocean surface, that is, around the size of France. Yet, they provide a home for 25 percent of all marine species. Diversity means variety and dissimilarity. It is a state and process of involving people who are different from each other into a group, and it aims to create an inclusive culture. Diversity is a natural setting, usually nothing we have to implement or fix. Diversity is the default. In artificial settings, like open source communities are, we have to take care for diversity ourselves. And first and overall, because diversity is just the right thing to do. As various, various studies show, diversity also enables us to solve complex problems better and faster, be more creative and stimulated through persistent exposure to minority perspective, make better decisions and generate more innovation. This means if a community is not diverse, it's broken. Diversity includes age, ability, ethnicity, socioeconomic class, personal background, gender and far more. Still, people do not fit into single boxes. 
all of us fall into a variety of dimensions. Every one of us has had different life experiences and perceives the world differently. Thus, we need to take care as well about the intersections of these groups. Let's take a look at some examples. According to the 2013 Floss poll, 89% of contributors to open source are men, 11% are women. But this is not just about a binary gender system here. Currently, there is so little space for LGBTIQ people in open source that there are not even numbers. And it's worst for people who are marginalized twice or even more, like, for example, women of color. We also need diversity in ethnicity. White people are still forming the major mass of people in open source, and we urgently need to get people of all ethnicities into our project. We also need to aim for diversity in skills and get non-coding people like designers, writers, people with organization skills, and many more on board. And we need diversity in ideas and backgrounds. The broader the amount of ideas, backgrounds, and experiences in our communities, the further we can go. And we need to aim for more. Working on diversity in our communities should be a daily task for every one of us. Or to like, phrase it like Aaron Hartwig recently did on Twitter, when everybody is making technology, the technology they make will be for everybody. Community means the appreciation of diversity and variety. Community culture is our daily answer to the question who, which people, and what, which kind of contributions are being welcomed and valued in our open source projects. There are strong values and goals behind open source software development, which are the reason why it exists and it is kept alive. Some of these values are, for example, providing alternatives to closed source software, enabling independence, and driving innovation. But there's one more reason why open source software is built. Software in general is built to perform useful work, run a computer system, solve problems, offer solutions, make things better, and more. But make things better for whom? Software is built for people. It's built for users. Any software exists for being used by someone. The number of developers in this world is 18 million people in total. That already includes hobbyists who are just coding as a hobby. And 18 million in total is, in comparison to the world population, 0.26%. Which means, for every software developer out there, there are 399 people who have other professions or just don't code. Now, let me just give those 399 people a few more colors to get them closer to reality. And there we go. When we're talking about software, we can't have this conversation without talking about users. Software is built for them. And each of those 399 people have their very own individual needs. And even our software developer themselves will also be a software user. This means that building software is an act of representation. Many of us, the people who are here today, are very privileged. And our realities are very far from those of millions of people on this planet. The users of our software are a very diverse group, and representation means responsibility. As people who work on software, we have this representation role to act according to. And this is why non-diverse communities working on software can just not be justified. Only moving beyond self-referential modes can enable us to develop infrastructure, processes, products, and work that resonate with the broader population. Misrepresentation leads to serious issues, one of them illustrated here in a tweet by Jehuda Katz. The JavaScript community loves good enough solutions, where good enough means horribly broken except for my case. We already have representation problems in our community itself, and it's not getting better outside this community. We have to fulfill our representation roles properly in our communities, so we can finally enable people to really trust the software we're building. 
I want to give you an example which depicts the trust issues we're exposing our users to far too often. The Queer Chorus, a choir, member, choir group in Austin, Texas, had a Facebook group for its choir's members. The president of this choir chorus added two members of the choir to this Facebook group. What the president didn't know, Facebook automatically told all their friends that they were now members of the Queer Chorus Facebook group. Thing is, both those people had decided to not inform their friends and families about being queer. It was Facebook that did that for them, by inadvertently exposing this information to their friends and families. Facebook made a choice instead of leaving it up to them. Many more people have been stung by accidentally revealing secrets online that were easier kept in the past. We need to keep examples like this in mind and build software that's res that respects its users. The topic of proper user representation is also linked with one of the core values and goals of open source, freedom. Freedom is the idea of giving users choices, power and control over the tools they use. It's often stated that users are enabled to see how the apps they use work, check if they're secure and change them if they want to. So let me ask you another question and I'd ask you to raise your hands again. Who of you has at least once read the source code of your mail server that your email provider runs for you? <laughs> oh, one person? Kudos. <laughs> so we have to ask how many people actually can do this? How many people have not only the interest, but also the resources and knowledge to check the source code of their software? How close to people's actual realities can this idea of freedom practically be? The idea of long-term freedom for users through open source is a great goal which we have to perceive. But we have to take care to not make this a patronizing ideal that forgets about many people's realities. Instead, we have to build products that understand people's needs and their capabilities, and we have to build them in diverse communities. So we can make this ideal of freedom a thing that is closer to people's realities than it is now. Another danger we're currently facing is shown by what happened to the Mayas. Although their culture and civilization were highly developed, it declined and suddenly disappeared around 800 to 900 BC. Some archaeologists add that the Maya collapse was merely a collapse of the ruling elites. These theories can't be proven 100%, but the Maya show us that it's neither change nor technology that threatened the integrity of a culture. The Maya had enough culture, change and technology, but it wasn't that what threatened them. It was power, the crude face of domination. If the needs of individuals in one culture are continually suppressed, social systems can become unstable. One person in the Fedora project study, which I mentioned before, said, I used to believe that this project was a community, but it seems more like a grouping of various anarchists and monarchists who think everyone else is like them. We really have to take care to avoid cliques and elites which exclude community members and enforce those unhealthy power structures which destabilize our communities. We have to stop the marginalization of people, the worshipping of heroes, bro culture, rock stars, code unicorns, and people who cannot be criticized anymore because of their status. This leads us to two other co core concepts and goals of open source, which are decentralization and democracy. Data shows that open source software is not quite as democratic and decentralized as it proclaims to be. Analysis shows that of 5 billion bytes of open source code, 74% was written by the most 10% active users. Democracy and decentralization in open source will both require diverse communities to enable more stable democratic processes and achieving real decentralization. Open source projects often also proudly refer to their meritocracy, 
the belief that those with merit flow to the top, that they should be given more opportunities and higher rewards. Finally, and sadly at the same time, the term meritocracy was originally coined as a negative example for a system with highly critical approaches. Noah Slater recently described meritocracy as a sort of meta story, which we repeat to each other and which we use to construct other stories that then explain things. For example, why people are included or excluded from our projects. Meritocracy is often celebrated as objective, whilst the homogeneity of open source and various studies show that it exacerbates the lack of diversity and institutionalizes structural inequality. This also includes that we have to find new models to value contribution. When we're thinking about building the future of open source, we have to include those who have less opportunity, less time, and less money that would allow them to freely contribute. We need to rethink what is being valued in open source projects, especially with the needs of marginalized people in our minds. And our main question should always be, who do we care for? Do we care for contributors who contribute, or do we care for people? This question is an essential one and a topic that is near and dear to me. People in our open source communities experience not only good times, they experience bad times, burnouts, mental health issues like depression and much more. These are serious issues which we can't ignore, and some of them are even enforced through structural inequality, meritocracy and community-related issues. We as members of open source communities have to implement a culture where mental health issues are not stigmatized, where we talk openly about them and lead an open discussion about how to avoid people burning out through open source contributions. We have to implement a culture in which people are heard and they know that there are people who care for them. We have to make sure to be there for the people in our projects and communities, not because we want them to keep contributing, but because we care for the people. You know that in our bodies, we have arteries and veins, both parts of our circulatory system. Arteries are the blood vessels that carry blood away from the heart, mostly oxygenated blood. There's a special coronary artery which is located directly at our heart. Its job is to supply blood to the heart muscle and thus keep it working. Still, it sometimes happens that there's plaque building up along the inner walls of the arteries of the heart. This plaque narrows the arteries. It reduces blood flow to the heart. It can progress without anyone noticing evidence for it for years. And what happens there is called coronary artery disease. As it progresses, it leads to lack of oxygen in the body's cells, can cause chest pain, and finally lead to death. In open source, our communities are our hearts. They nourish the entire body, our projects. Without our communities, open source is lost. Narrowing those communities by limiting and restricting their spaces leads to serious problems for individuals, communities, the products we're building, and finally endangers the future of open source in general. There are already many initiatives and individuals in open source and tech that are working on improving all those topics. These people and their allies are spending a significant amount of time on improving the culture we have in open source today. Some of them are, for example, Black Girls Code, Ash Dryden, LGB Tech, Model View Culture, Transhack, and many more. The least we all should do is listen to them, support their work, share what they're saying, and transfer this to the communities we're all in. We have to widen our communities, welcome and appreciate everyone, to ensure that our heart keeps beating, and to ensure that open source can have a future. Because open source can only have a future if it does everything to be inclusive. Thank you. <laughs>